uh, I should note, um, th uh, Roseanne, I'm, I do polling for Sam Cita as well as Bernie Sanders and a bunch of other candidates as well as the Honorable David Canepa. Hopefully he's still in the audience. Uh, they, uh, so uh, it, Roseanne invited me here to kind of tap into my national expertise as well as local expertise. And I gave a lot of thought about, um, you know, what to talk about. Do I talk about the challenges facing the polling industry post-November 2016, which are legitimate? Uh, although we are quite accurate that cycle when a lot of other pollsters got it wrong. But then I was like, what about California politics? But after June, quite frankly, the governor's race is pretty much a done deal. Gavin Newsom pretty much uh, having that a lock. Uh, and then I put some thought into questions which I grapple with every day as a pollster and a political strategist. And I realized these are questions which my friends and neighbors in the Bay Area, as well as family all over the country, are dealing with every day post November 2016, which is like what the hell is going on in the world today and what does it mean for California, San Mateo County? Uh, and this was done before this weekend's G7 summit, right? Where uh, I, I think it, I was like, oh my gosh, I'm even more prescient than I thought. So, um, uh, you know, and I, I, I apologize in advance if I'm not quite as upbeat as my previous uh, speakers were. So, uh, but I'll try to have a little bit of optimism at the end. But, uh, but in all seriously, things are, are, are fairly, uh, dr yeah, it, serious right now. Uh, I mean, it's hard to put a, a finer point to it. Uh, you have Brexit, you have Donald Trump's election, uh, a surprising success of Bernie Sanders, who obviously can speak for hours at length about that. Um, the rise of right-wing populists in Europe, uh, major economic, technological, cultural, and societal changes. I mean, you saw the, uh, some of the previous thread speakers today talk about some of these social changes. It's great, it's optimistic, but it's having a real impact on our society, and there are trade-offs to those changes. Um, and our politics is becoming more polarized and radicalized, uh, both in this country and around the world. So, um, you know, big questions here, which is, are capitalism-based democracies able to handle these changes? Uh, and I don't have a definitive answer for you, but we'll all kind of brainstorm with you today about some things about uh, how we kind of get out of this morass. But uh, I think there's one data uh, slide in particular that I think this kind of uh, helps answer the question of what's going on in the world today. Um, let me kind of skip ahead to this one slide. Some of you may have seen this slide. This was in the New York Times, and it's a slide of uh, income growth, uh, basically historic income growth. Uh, and it was put together by Thomas Pickett. He's a really famous economist about, just done a lot of studies on income inequality. And basically the gray uh, chart, this line is, uh, income growth by income percentile in 1980. So basically the downward slope of the curve meant if you made less money, you had higher income growth. If you made more money, you had lower income growth. Uh, and I would say that's good for stability and democracy and having uh, uh, kind of a more thriving uh, economy and democracy, a capitalist democracy. Uh, and why was that? Union uh, concentration was higher. You had higher tax rates on upper income. You had more investment in, in education. So you had a, you had a different economy that, you know, four, 30 years ago than you do today. Um, so various reasons in the red line is income growth in 2014, and it's, um, you know, looks like a hockey stick. And what's the, the peak uh, up there? Basically, those in the 0.001% have the highest rate of income growth, and those at the bottom end of the curve have the lowest rate of income growth. And for me, as I've thought a lot about this issue working for Bernie Sanders, I also worked on the mil millionaire's tax in California that successfully passed and raised uh, income on, uh, raised taxes on upper income earners to fund education and other essential services in California, um, that, uh, you know, rising tides lift all boats in a, in a capitalist system and a democracy, but when the tide isn't rising, you have real challenges in our society. And for me, that's what I, explains a lot about what's going on in the world. And again, I had an inside perspective on, on Bernie Sanders' campaign, his message of, uh, you know, a rigged economy. He's going to take on a rigged economy propped up by a corrupt political finance system. I was, you know, one of the um, you know, strategists that helped drive that message. Um, and it had a lot of success, and I had kind of a good handle on why it was so successful, uh, even though he started at basically 0% of the polls. Um, but what this leads to is uh, essentially, um, uh, uh, essentially a very grumpy, angry electorate. This is the uh, data uh, of right direction, wrong track. 
Uh, essentially, it's a basic question pollsters have been asking for uh, almost a, you know 80 years now. And you see, for a decade, the American electorate has been in a very uh, grumpy mood, uh, a sustained grumpy mood for a long time. It's the longest period of sustained grumpiness this country's ever had, right? Uh, and so, and you see the red line is wrong track, the right is right direction. You see a blip up got the parity only in the aftermath of Barack Obama's election in 2008. So remember, we had the Great Recession. People were feeling very, very bad about the country post uh, the Iraq War. As a, a, a kind of a, a challenge of the Iraq War, uh, George W. Bush's second term, uh, voters became much more pessimistic. There was a surge of optimism with Obama, but then as, he, as the country struggled to, to get out of the recession, voters fell back into their uh, 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 grumpy mood again. And, and, and this, you see this, and then you see um, uh, direct correlation to uh, the congressional job approval. Voters are grumpy. They don't feel good about the way things are going in this country. They don't feel great about the economy because the vast majority of them are not seeing their incomes rise. They're dealing with high, higher health care costs, higher cost of college, higher cost of housing, higher cost of living, and their incomes are flat or marginally or not, or not ma ma matching the higher cost of living. Uh, they're falling behind and they're getting frustrated uh, about that situation. And at the same time, as you see in the United States and in Europe, you have this influx of immigration. Uh, of, of people coming from failed states or states that are even struggling even more, coming to places like Europe, the United States, looking for opportunity, in part because of technology changes. Social media, people in the far parts of the world see what's going on, the rest of the world like, oh my gosh, there's a better life out there for me, I'm gonna go pursue it. Uh, but those people do not look like the people who live in these countries have the last couple hundred years. So there's a real, there's literally a changing face of our society. And if you have a rising tide and a growing economy, everyone's doing better, no problem. In the, in the height of the dot-com boom around the country, illegal immigration was not an issue that we dealt with as pollsters. No one cared about illegal immigration. No one cared about pensions or, uh, you know, pension, uh, public employees getting pensions. But you have flat incomes. Uh, declining benefits in the private sector, and all of a sudden you have white working class voters who are getting left behind in the Midwest, very, very disgruntled and angry about what's going on in the world uh, and feeling left behind. And, um, and then if you can tap into that effectively as a politician, uh, which Bernie Sanders did from a progressive perspective, uh, but, but Donald Trump did more, even more effectively from, from the conservative perspective, uh, you, get, you get change elections. Um, and, um, and then this is what you get. This is a number of House seats that have changed in elections dating back to 1950. And you basically what happens is once a decade you get a, a wave election, right? You get uh, a landslide presidential election like LBJ in 1964 or Richard Nixon in 72 or Ronald Reagan in 84 or uh, you know, a major recession, for example, you get a change election. But you see what's happened in the last several years, you've had massive amounts of volatility and changeover. You had 2006, a reaction against the Iraq war and George Bush. 2008, Obama's election, change election. 2010, a reaction against Obama and, 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 and the ACA and the Obamacare. Uh, and now I believe we're poised for another wave election this fall. Um, you know, with Democrats poised to win back the House. Uh, we'll see if that uh, wave comes, but I feel, uh, I'm pulling a lot of these congressional races and feel pretty good about it. So you have a lot more political volatility in an era where incomes aren't increasing and voters are increasingly frustrated. Um, and uh, you know how, what, how it boils down to California and San Mateo County. Look, California is a Democratic state. Our coalition, the Democratic coalition, the Democratic pollster, is uh, you know upper middle class, well educated Caucasians, Latinos, and, and African Americans, voters of color. Well, California, there are a lot of those segments of the electorate, right? Go to Ohio. I'm working uh, in a Senate, U.S. Senate race in Ohio. Uh, not, we're missing many factions of that uh, coalition. So California is going to remain blue. Gavin Newsom is going to be the next governor. Uh, you know, Steve Poizner could be the next insurance commissioner. I said if Democrat is going to uh, win every statewide race, although he's gonna, he, he left the Republican Party because of the demise of the Republican Party, switched to insurance uh, independent. He could buy himself onto the insurance commissioner. But other than that, uh, Democrats are going to pick up a lot of congressional seats and the, and the two third, when, likely went back the two thirds supermajority in the state legislature. Uh, in terms of San Mateo County, the impact here, essentially you're a victim of your own success. You have a thriving economy, a vibrant economy, a diverse economy. So what are the pressures here? We're working with Sam C to solve some of them. Transportation, you have a lot of people working. You got a lot of traffic. You got some real challenges on gridlock and traffic. Uh, growth, you know, people grumbling about growth and too much growth. 
Um, and the cost of housing, of course, because you have a good economy, people making good money, and they can pay more and more for houses. So, uh, you know, the good news is things are going well for you in San Mateo County. Uh, the challenge is uh, you're facing, uh, how do you solve these problems? Uh, the Sam Cita, I'm working with Sam Cita, uh, voters are realizing these are problems that, and they're starting to throw money at it. So they're starting to pass transportation measures. So hopefully we'll be successful this November uh, in housing, same thing. Although uh, I would say if the boom continues, there could be a backlash against development. But um, anyway, hopefully this explains the craziness that's going on in the world. I can't explain Trump, sorry. But um, uh, but uh, but I can explain, hopefully this provides a little more context of why he got elected and what it looks like moving forward, which is a lot of uncertainty. Uh, but I'm glad to hear from my previous speakers. There's a lot of things to be good about. Let's focus on the, the, the those projects, uh, but stay, uh, you know, uh, Stay close attention, pay close attention to the news and do what you can to get active and we'll see if we can weather this storm. But thank you.